One in 12 passengers on all international flights in 2018 held a British passport. That's more than any other nationality. One person, though, not included in that statistic is our guest today, Molly Scott Cato. She's a green economist, which might sound like an oxymoron, but we're going to explore that more later. And she's also chosen to go flight free. Molly, what prompted your decision? Well, I decided when I was still working as an academic and I was really astonished by the amount that academics fly. Obviously, the climate crisis was a reality then, you know, 10, 15 years ago as it is today. And so I just decided that I didn't need to contribute any more emissions. So I more or less gave up flying. Yeah, well, t 2003. So it's going on for 15 years. It's more than 15 years now. Quite some time ago. How did people react? Yeah, I think people were pretty surprised, actually. It's such an everyday part of life, isn't it, flying, and especially amongst academics. And some people felt it was a little bit of an accusation. And definitely there were ways in which my career was limited because I'd get invitations to Malaysia or New York or wherever, and I had to say I'll join by video conference, and they say, no, thank you. So then I just didn't do those things. So, yeah, it had quite a big impact, I would say, as an academic. And what were some of the upsides, any? Highlight. Oh yeah, I mean you find out how to get around the world without flying, which is like an adventure, it's very exciting, and uh, you find other people who are doing the same thing, and you find out how to travel by cargo ship and night train and all these, I think, much more romantic and enjoyable ways of travelling. I think some people might be a bit deterred by the idea of sacrifice. No one wants to sac make sacrifices, do they? And part of what we tried to encourage and inspire with the Green Weekend was that you don't need to compromise to actually have a nice leisurely holiday. So. You know, what, what would you say to that? that? How would you assuage concerns from people that might say, oh, that's a bit too much for me? I think you need to ask why people are flying in the first place. I mean, for most people, their flight is about their annual holiday. And why do people like having an annual holiday? Because they don't have to work, because they have leisure time, because they spend time with their family, they do some drinking, you know, they probably eat nice food. All the things that people enjoy about their holidays can be found without flying abroad, as you demonstrated in your film. You know, there's amazing bits of the country to explore. I mean, I spent quite a few years exploring a different part of the country without a car every year with my daughter on holidays, and we just had some fantastic holidays. So holiday is, um, you know, is about leisure, is about spending time with people you love. You don't need to fly to do that. And then you've got the business flights, and to be honest... Most of those, I think, are completely unnecessary and just should be replaced with video conferencing and Skyping and so on. So, yeah, we could definitely get rid of 90% of flights and people's lives, I think, will be better, not, not worse. It's like so much in that sort of climate space, isn't there? It's, like, it's not about sacrificing it. It's just sometimes the changes will bring genuine social benefits definitely. and societal benefits. I think there's a sort of thinking by people that don't travel a lot that there's something glamorous about traveling but you know as an MEP I had to travel every week I mean if I was still an MEP I'd have to go to Strasbourg today and uh, there's nothing glamorous or fun about that it was honestly a schlep and I think most business travel is like that and yeah mm. holiday travel I just think there's been a sort of lack of creative thinking about how to make holidays in this country much more enjoyable mm. I mean the big problem we have is the weather so I have this sort of dream that somebody will set up lovely sort of you know, centre park style domes and you can just live within it and have this artificial climate, which I think might encourage people to stay in this country a bit more. But, you know, it shouldn't be down to you and me, should it, thinking up these mm. ideas. What's the tourism industry up to? It's just selling people cheap package holidays that, to be honest, aren't that great. Should be more creative, I think. Do you think flying is justified in any sense? Well, I, you said I'm a, a no-fly person, and I've never said that I'll never fly again, so, you know, maybe I will fly again one day. I think the point is people shouldn't see it as a first alternative, and they shouldn't see it as something that they can just do whenever they choose. I think it should be seen as a last resort, mm -hmm. and before you take a flight, you should say to yourself, you know, is that journey really necessary? And then you should ask, is it possible to do it without flying? And any journey you take in Europe is possible to do without flying, and should be taken without flying, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Trump speaking as an economist, do you think there might be some commercial opportunities or financial gains to be made from encouraging more sustainable travel? Well, as you said at the beginning, I'm a green economist, so that means I'm not an economist that thinks growth is, a, is necessarily a good thing, or profit, or commercial opportunities. I mean, I would like to move towards an economy where people are a lot happier. We have a lot less uh, impact on the environment, and we probably have a lot more leisure time and actually do and produce less. So if there was a, a decline in economic growth because people were flying less, in my book, that's a good thing. 
But I do think there are, yeah, there, there are alternatives that will expand. Train travel, for example, especially night trains. Mm. Also, video conferencing is there, and it's a relatively low energy option, but people just don't use it. And again, I think that's because employers don't encourage their staff to use it, and I think there's a lot of scope there for businesses that encourage people to communicate without moving around. What prospect is there for cross-party collaboration on important issues like climate change, when there is a Tory government enjoying an 80-seat majority? Well, if we start with the European angle, I mean, it's been brilliant being an MEP because we've all kind of contributed what is natural in our politics to sorting out climate change. So there's no argument, I would say, in the EU that climate change is a crisis and we have to deal with it rapidly. And so we've just had a cross-party approach and that's obviously the best way of dealing with it. Now this government obviously is uh, hardly the government of my choice and I think it's very problematic to see them making progress on climate in the next five years in this country and it's particularly embarrassing with, with Glasgow coming to see how, you know, in the, the next round of the global negotiations on climate change to see how far behind the rest of the world we are. Um, and obviously the government has taken money from fossil fuel interests and it's just committed to a totally different view of the economy that flies in the face of climate action. So. I can't really give you much hope in terms of government in this country, but we've seen the green wave and many more people voting green across Europe, and that's meant greens going into government in other countries. So, you know, the policy change is really quite dramatic. So, for example, in Sweden, they've negotiated to introduce night trains so that Swedes can get around Europe without flying, and the German greens may go into government soon, and they've said that they'll phase out domestic flights within the next 10 years. And in Luxembourg, my old mate Claude Terms, who used to be an MEP, is now the Energy Minister and they have introduced free public transport. So you can look around Europe and you can see the kinds of policies that we need to introduce. And that again, I think, would improve people's quality of life here because, you know, what's not to like about free public transport and what's not to like about much cheaper trains and more frequent trains? I think most people are ready for radical political change. The blockage now is politicians not acting fast enough. It's lobbying and opposition from those who will lose as we make the transition to sustainability and its political systems, especially in the British and American case, that are deliberately designed to prevent radical changes and to block radical changes. Those are the problems we've got. If somebody came out you know, with a clear policy programme of how to tackle climate change um, and you know, provide public transport and frequent flyer levy, so you paid more for your flights, I believe people would support that. Mm. Um, people are anxious and they're waiting for leadership on climate. And in other countries where the Greens offer leadership, then people respond by voting for them and that then changes policy. So yeah, the priority here is getting our politics sorted out because I, I think people are ready for change and the way they're voting shows you that they're really dissatisfied with um, the way politics is working. You know, we saw that in the Irish elections yesterday, we've seen it in elections right across Europe and across the world in fact. So no, I, I don't I don't buy this thing that you know you should be afraid of how you introduce climate policies. I think people are ready for it. You, you have to be careful that you do it in a way that's just so you don't make the poor pay. But uh, everybody is ready to change and we've seen the catastrophes. They will only get worse mm. and I think people are well aware of what needs to happen. You consider social justice as important as cutting emissions. But if you look at a company like Flybe that was recently given a, a stay of execution or a reprieve from the British government, they're obviously a domestic carrier. What if someone who relied on Flybe to get to work, what if, if Flybe went under, they lose their job? Where's the trade-off between social gain versus environmental policy? Where's the line and who draws it? The point is that most of the environmental damage is being done by the wealthiest people and their lifestyles. So most of the flights are taken by the richest people. On average, Brits take one flight every two years. So your extraordinary statistic that one in 12 people on an international flight is a Brit means that the richest Brits are flying an awful lot and they are the climate criminals. They are the people that are making it impossible for future generations to have a life. And so to me, it's, it's clear that not only do we need system change, we need greater equity also to tackle climate change. Um, you know, because, yeah, we'll be taxing some people more, but the revenue from that tax will be invested so poorer people will have access to public transport, for example. So the climate revolution will also be a social justice revolution. And I think sustainable development was invented as an oxymoron because, you know, people recognise that 
we were living unsustainably and they wanted to avoid sort of the, the kind of transformation I'm talking about. So they invented this concept of sustainable development, yeah. like everything will be the same, but it'll be sustainable. But in order to tackle climate change, everything has to change. So in actual fact, everything has to regress. I, I don't see it as a regression at all. I see it as an opportunity to achieve the sort of social transformation that I've wanted all my life. Yes. Greater equality, yeah. um, stronger local communities, yeah, reduced energy use, but actually more leisure as well. So the sort of treadmill of work, you know, working to get more material possessions that don't make you happy, losing contact with your friends, this kind of awful treadmill that we live in in the economy today, you know, is the opposite of a sustainable life, and that's what we have to get rid of. Are there any policies that you know of that have been discussed, even in the European Parliament, about eco-travel in particular? Well, yeah, the great thing about um, Greta Thunberg and the youth strike movement is that the scope for discussing much more radical policy has really increased in the, the last couple of years. And so there's now, I think, quite widespread support for tax on aviation fuel. I mean, it seems crazy that we're sitting here even discussing that, because why is it that aviation is given a, a free ride? You know, but that, anyway, that dates back to 1944 and people hide behind that convention. But we could just leave the Chicago Convention, you know, and we should do that unless there's a, an agreement about taxing aviation fuel. That would make flights more expensive and it would make travelling by train relatively cheaper. So that's one important thing. I also personally support uh, carbon tax generally so that it's expensive to produce carbon dioxide and that there's a clear indication that it will become more expensive every year. That's the fastest way of driving fossil fuels out of the economy and reducing the energy intensity of the economy. And both those things are in discussion now at European level and may well come into force. And they're both you know, really strong sort of levers on the economy and on the transport sector. But we're caught between um, what we believe is politically possible and the need for human survival. And that's the point about Extinction Rebellion. They yeah. come out and they say, tell the truth. Mm. You know, there's the end point by which we have to have got rid of all CO2 emissions. You know, we're nowhere near on the trajectory to reach that point. If we don't reach that point, then we're talking about the end of human civilization. So my view is, let's save human civilization. therefore let's do what's necessary. It's not really something you can bargain about. You know, you can't bargain with the global atmosphere. So... Once you're clear about the scale of emissions reduction that you need to see, then you have to follow through on the policy consequences. And, yeah, in terms of aviation, that means really serious reductions very soon. So that, those are the kind of examples I was going to ask for. Maybe, maybe you could list one or two examples of jobs that might be replaced from closing down the local airport, for example. It would be, it would be transport, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, there are other forms of transport. You know, if you're not um, flying, then you're likely to be travelling by train, so mm -hmm. there'd be jobs created in trains instead but also we should be building the trains you know we should mm -hmm. be much more ambitious in terms of our industrial policy at the moment we don't build well we do build trains but they're not british companies mm -hmm. but um, we invented the train no i mean you think <laughs> of isabel yeah. kingdom brunel the train and, was our major contribution yeah. to world culture in my view maybe shakespeare but you know yeah. alongside it's up there trains trains are an amazing thing and also we do need to expand capacity and electrify our trains. So there's another huge investment we need to be making instead of subsidising aviation. What little change can people make today that might make a difference tomorrow? Stop flying. <laughs> it's fairly clear, isn't it? That's little is, 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 is the operative term is there. Is that a big change? I, uh, okay. For some people it is. When you've done it, it doesn't feel yeah. like such a big change. OK, so here's a small change people can make. They can visit the Rail Europe website and they can, the next time they're going to travel anywhere in Europe, they can make sure they visit the Rail Europe site before they go to a flight site and they can make sure that their next annual holiday is not does not involve flying anywhere so you know fine go to France but go by train or have a holiday in this country honestly people will find they really enjoy that it, it well obviously it doesn't feel like a big change to me at all but if it does feel like a big change then just try and see it as an adventure